This morning we are going to become involved in an extremely difficult and sticky situation. And that is the gentle subject of money. And I don't know of any way to approach this philosophically in a more interesting manner than to go back to Egypt in ancient times. We're not sure that the monetary system originated in Egypt, but it was certainly functioning there two or three thousand B.C. And because the Egyptians were rather wise and interesting people, their opinions on these on this subject, while symbolical, I think is worthy of consideration. In Egypt, we are introduced to one of the earliest bankers. Now, in those days, they didn't call them bankers. They called them money changers. And this was a highly respectable occupation. In uh, ancient times, most localities, cities, and countries had their own currencies. And when they traveled as citizens from one country to another, the individual had to change their money before they could spend it in a foreign country. So at the gate of the city was the money changer. He was seated behind a table or counter and had within his mind or in adequate notes the relative values of all currencies. And as the stranger came to the gate of the city, if he intended to spend money therein, he had to get the local currency. This was no great problem. And for the most part, the system worked very well. Occasionally, however, one of these money changers misbehaved. He could do several things. Many of those who came to him to exchange their coins did not know the prevailing rates for all the communities. And it's quite conceivable that occasionally the money changer shortchanged the customer. This was considered unethical, even at that time. And if a money changer was discovered to be dishonest, they took his table, on which he had his various instruments and materials laid out, and smashed it. Now, at that time, the table was called a bank. And it meant a table. The word table, the word bank means a table, primarily. And to break a table was to rupt it. So a dishonest bank, a dishonest money changer went bankrupt when his table was broken. And this is the origin of a term, and you can check it in the dictionary. It is still perfectly acceptable. Now, the money changer in himself uh, was usually a good-natured soul. And uh, for the most part, he was dominated by the religious teachings of the community in which he functioned. And so it happens that a philosophy dealing with this phase of life was developed at an early date. If a money changer was honorable honest, and uh, a little on the generals, a generous side, if possible, especially for the widow's might and the coinage of the underprivileged. And the time came for him to die. He presented himself, or his soul was presented for him by the guardians of the gates of the other world, and he was taken into the hall of the great judgment, where the psychostasia ritual was performed the judging of the souls of the dead. The judgment consisted of a court, consisting of assessors or jurors, and this is the origin of our jury system in law. And it was presided over by Osiris, the god of the afterlife, and the judge of the quick and the dead. Each applicant for admission into the afterlife was required to recite the negative confession of being. 
This negative confession has been declared to be one of the most astonishing documents in the history of mankind. And it is assumed that very few of those who appeared before the judge of the dead could possibly meet the requirements of this negative confession honestly. But as the jurors were there, and they were deities who could read the hearts and minds of men, uh, the person under consideration had to be reasonably accurate. Now, among the hundred statements of the negative confession, the soul of the departed had to be say, able to say honestly that never in his life had he cheated any man. Now, that's a pretty big thing to say. He also had to say that without any question of doubt that he had been charitable, that he had helped the widow and the fatherless, and that he had used his position as money changer for the benefit of the community. He was permitted to make a small charge for the money changing, and that was all he was entitled to. Now, if he was reasonably innocent... Uh, he might well be allowed by the jurors to pass into the afterlife. If there were some doubts, but on the whole he was pretty good, then Horus, the beloved son of Osiris, interceded for the soul of the dead, saying that he would carry the punishment or bear it, and the soul should be permitted to go into the afterlife. What happened to those who fail utterly is not part of the present story but they met a proper and appropriate reward or penalty. Having entered into the afterlife, our honest money changer was then permitted to set up his table at the gate of heaven. And those who came in from all different directions had to change their money at his table because the coinage of the mortal world was not accepted in the heavenly region. It was of no value over there. So it had to be transformed into a medium suitable to the life beyond the grave. I think this is a very ingenious thought. And of course, what did the individual bring with him? He couldn't bring the cash. That was obvious. What was the coin that he could carry into the afterlife and have it exchanged for a blissful existence? That coinage, of course, was his own merit. The only coin that was acceptable was his own conscience, his own integrity, and his own fitness. He had to be rewarded according to his works and he had to receive a medium of exchange that it was acceptable in heaven. This, of course, gives us a very good symbolic idea. It was necessary that he have saved up his treasures for the other life. He had to come bearing the necessary symbols which entitled him to the reward which he had earned. So the transformation of the currency represented the rewarding of virtue and the changing of worldly wealth into its spiritual equivalent. This spiritual equivalent was his own character. It was his own merit and sometimes his demerit. But if he was a good man and brought his proper coinage, he received the tokens of the other world a world beyond the grave. And he was then allowed to go in and invest or expend his accumulated spiritual wealth for the comfort and continuance of his after-death state. Now this is interesting because it tells us a lot about psychology. The individual who was the money changer continued to be a money changer. The fact that he had passed on didn't put a halo on him or crown him into the group of the celestials. He continued to live as he had lived in this world. But it was no longer a material world. 
It was that kind of world which the ancients considered to be a kind of sleep. A sleep. And as we learn in the soliloquy of Hamlet, in this sleep of death, what dreams may come shall give us pause. In other words, the whole thing was an internal experience. The money changer had his experience, if he was honest. He continued to do the things he was fitted to do. He continued to build his experiences from the previous life, and he would carry forward into the next life the merits and the internal spiritual experience and maturity which he had gained through honest dealing. This type of thought brings us very much into the psychological area, namely that success and failure, wealth and poverty, justice, reward and penalty, are mysterious experiences of the inner life, the life which we all must face between embodiments, and our condition is determined by ourselves. When a farmer entered into the great Amentet, the Elysian Fields of the Blessed, he did not become a politician or a philosopher or a theologian. He was given a beautiful allotment of land, and here he was also given a spirit oxen to work the field, and he worked it with a plow, and the celestial Nile never failed to irrigate his land, and he became a happy and well-adjusted farmer because that was what he was. Now this does not mean that all life ends in farming. It means, however, that all life is a rewarding for accomplishment and the individual being permitted by his own virtue to fulfill his own life constructively, beautifully, and unselfishly. This was the law of Egypt. This was the concept behind the development of a belief in the exchange of worldly goods. Now on a more prosaic and a more material level, we also know that the Egyptians had their own way of handling barter. Barter was the earliest form of exchange, and barter was the basis of our monetary system. In very ancient times, barter was an exchange of like for like, in value, if not in commodity. If a man had a flock of sheep, and he wished to barter one or more of these sheep for something else that he needed or wanted, he went to the common market, and in many countries even today, barter is very largely the basis of all transactions. So he would drive a couple of sheep to town, and exchange them for a cow or for clothing or for whatever he needed. Now there's one point in this that's very important. In the barter system of that type, it was up to the original owner to protect the value of that which he hoped to exchange for something else. If the farmer, anxious to make a few extra dollars, did not feed his sheep, and they came scraggly and poor and thin into the market, he would get very little for them, because they were not kept up. And therefore, it was up to him to make sure that his collateral was in good condition. And if he took proper care of his own goods, then it could be exchanged for goods of equal quality. This placed a kind of censorship upon all transaction, because if the sheep was not properly cared for, it was simply not a serviceable instrument of exchange. When a wealthy Egyptian decided to buy something, he went to the shop where he could get what he wanted, and when the transaction was finished, he was given a little clay tablet, two or three inches square. Into this tablet, he impressed his signet ring. This signet ring was his bond. Now, the dealer who secured the uh, signet uh, stone had several possibilities. He could, of course, change it with some other dealer for something else he wanted. 
and the token became a medium of ex general exchange. If, however, he did not wish to barter it, he could take it to the house of the owner or the person who had given it to him, and at the door of the house was the steward, usually seated. The steward accepted the token and gave the merchant its equivalent in coinage or whatever he needed. There was never any question as to the integrity of the transaction. Somewhere in our collection upstairs we have one of these token bills pressed upon clay. It was a sign of honest and proper uh, transaction. And uh, the person who received it had no doubt about it being redeemed, nor did anyone through whose hands it passed. It was known beyond doubt that the original man who put his seal upon it was honorable, honest, and capable of meeting the indebtedness. Thus we have a beginning of a medium of exchange. Gradually it became obvious that bringing sheep to market to change for something else was a rather complicated procedure. So it became necessary to develop some form of symbolic medium of exchange. Every nation of antiquity developed such uh, types of material. There are coins that have come down to us that are cast in glass from very ancient dates. There are others that were cut into stone. Some were made into porcelain. And other various proper symbols, American Indian wampum, beadwork, the quarry shell of, a, of the South Pacific, all of these were mediums of exchange. In early Virginia colony, a bundle of tobacco leaves was currency. All these different forms were intended to facilitate transactions. And when it came so complicated that no one could really bring all his produce to market himself, then it became very important that he have tokens by which he could claim payment or by which he could give payment. These tokens multiplied and became more and more complicated. But in every instance, the token served only one purpose. It stood for value. It represented a legitimate monetary or financial or commercial value. It was given as a symbol of an object. Now, for instance, you can say, we have what do we call today chattel mortgages. The word chattel, if you look it up, means cattle. And a chattel mortgage was an indebtedness placed upon a herd of animals. Of course, today it would be rather difficult and embarrassing to uh, drive a, a herd of cows into a bank. But still in ancient times, always one thing was true. The token, whatever it was, was for value. And that value was fixed by the commodity patterns of the time. There was no escaping the simple fact that the token of itself had no value. The little lump of clay wasn't worth anything. The dollar bill cost to make it only a fraction of a cent. It has no value in itself. It is a symbol of value. Now, as long as it remained a symbol of value, we had a comparatively honorable state of exchanges. As long as this symbol was not expected to be a thing of value, but was only a symbol of a personal relationship, either through purchase or sale. As long as this continued, things were relatively honest. Gradually, however, a change took place. In this change, the commodity, the token, began to be regarded as valuable in itself. It was possible to accumulate these tokens, and by accumulation of them, to declare to others that we possessed a kind of wealth. 
when a knight in the Middle Ages got short of change, he took his armor or his helmet to the armorer, the man who made it, who would loan him a little money on it temporarily. This again was only a form of barter. The collateral was held against the payment of the debt, but the collateral had no value other than as a symbol of an ethical transaction. When the early Dutch in uh, the end of Manhattan, south end of Manhattan Island, got together under a tree to form a benevolent association of mutual protection, it was the beginning of the stock exchange. That's how it all started. It was always a use of some convenient symbol by means of which transactions could be made more rapidly and more certainly and honorably. Gradually, the theory of accumulation took over. And of course, this theory of accumulation went head-on into the Egyptian philosophy of life. Namely, that whatever you accumulated could only be with you for the duration of your present existence. Some of the Druids of Britain are said to have borrowed money in one lifetime and guaranteed to pay it back in a later embodiment. <laughs> this system, however, never became generally popular. <laughs> but the theory was always the same, that we had to have some way of dealing with each other in the necessities of life. One man raised the corn, another man wove the goods. The cloth and the corn were values. The man who ro wo uh, rose, uh, worked the corn changed it for yardage. This went on until finally we forgot the fact that the medium of exchange was a completely physical instrument. It had very little to do with anything except what it was intended to be, a way of handling a transaction. This gradually resulted in the concept that the coinage was something of eternal value, something that could be hoarded, something that could be passed on from one generation to another, and that finally, a superiority in this life was symbolized by coinage. Now, in old days, of course, coinage was not a symbol as it is to us. We look back upon the tales and legends of great wealth in antiquity. But most of this great wealth was in the hands of persons who had forgotten their own mortality. They had forgotten that they could not take it with them. They also learned, as they learned in Greece, that to pass it on to your descendants was one of the most dangerous procedures in the world, because in most cases it became a detriment upon the descendant. It prevented the descendant from going out and earning his own way. It prevented him from becoming a useful citizen, cooperating with others for the benefit of his society. He became an aristocrat simply because he accumulated little marks placed on tablets of clay or printed on the face of money. All this changed our psychology of life, and gradually, out of what we term the profit system, there has evolved the physical economic complexity which we know today. We have forgotten that we are not here primarily to accumulate. If we were going to live forever, it would be different. But in this foreverness of the, higher, of the higher world of things, the coinage cannot be considered immortal. It is part of a very simple procedure, a procedure of food, clothing, shelter, a, a procedure of guaranteeing the necessities of life by earning them and by earning them to gain the tokens or symbols by which we could meet our responsibilities. In those days, there was no idea, whatever, of money making money. Money was to be used by the person who earned it 
to meet the requirements of his society and to carry himself rather than to become a dependent upon society. As we went along in this particular problem, another situation appeared almost immediately. And this is very intriguing. The moment a standardized form of currency came into existence, two things happened. Maybe both, or at least one of them. One was that this currency could be devaluated. The Roman emperors, uh, when they got into financial trouble, instead of issuing silver coins, made their coins of copper and coated them with silver. It seems to me that happened around here not too long ago. <laughs> Gradually, the coin no longer had a factual value. Now, as its moral and ethical value declined, its factual value became more obviously important in commerce. It became necessary that the coin itself be of some substance equal in value to the debt. The second thing that could happen and did happen frequently was that both the coinage and the currency or paper money was, were, was counterfeited. Now, counterfeiting began at a very early time. It became part of our way of life as soon as it became obvious that it was profitable. The earliest paper money that we have any record of was issued in China during the Ming Dynasty, around 12 to 1300 A.D. This paper money was about the size uh, now of a, a typewriter sheet. It was marked with seals and various symbols of authority, and it contained its value stated in terms of strings of cash, pictures of strings of small money. On, the, on each of these notes appeared the statement that anyone guilty of counterfeiting one of these bills would be shortened by the length of one head. But needless to say, this was not discouraging. The counterfeiting continued. And, uh, will, and passed from one nation to another. Today, most coinage has been counterfeited somewhere because of it being profitable. It was a falsification. It was a definite a act of dishonesty, uh, but uh, it was tolerated. The culprit was punished, but the process went on. So the paper money got to be in bad repute in China as early as the 14th century. And from there on to the establishment of the Republic by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, paper money was practically never circulated in China. No one trusted it because it was worth nothing in itself. You couldn't eat it. It even made a very small fire if you tried to burn it. It was of comparatively no value unless behind it was a staple system of financial integrities. In China also, coinage was variously adulterated. A, a shrewd Chinese would take a bag full of small silver coins and get one of his younger children to shake that bag by the hour. At the end of a certain length of time, the shaking caused little shavings of the silver to separate. He then washed the bag and cashed the profit. In China also, large silver coins were cut through horizontally, hollowed out, and sealed again. And, to, and it's late as, well, within the last four, 50 years. Uh, the Chinese banks put purple stamps on dollars and other larger coins to prove that they had not been tampered with. Even in this country, many farming banks and small business would never uh, give change for a silver dollar without dropping the dollar on a piece of marble set into the front of the cash register to hear it ring, to make sure that it was genuine. So counterfeiting came in. And counterfeiting, however, was of no value and of no profit unless 
there was a genuine article. The counterfeit had to be uh, based upon a value. And counterfeiting goes on, and on papers a few days ago, a counterfeiting ring was broken up. Thus money began to get on all kinds of nasty appearances. Not because it had anything to do with the bill or the silver, but because of those evil ones who lay in wait for it. Someone asked Plato once why gold was such a pale metal. He answered, because it fears those who seek to possess it. The paleness is terror. Actually, the, the gradual development of the situation resulted in the rise of a great theory of money. This theory of money became the basis, practically, of human society. And within the last 50 years, the mistake has become obvious. We are finding ourselves captured in an economic part, uh, problem which no one as yet seems to be able to solve. The problem of the considering a medium of exchange as a capital gain in itself. Materialism, of course, has always nourished uh, the concept of wealth. Now, wealth thoroughly and basically is considered in ancient times as a process in marriage. Wealth was the individual reward for individual industry. Wealth was necessary to a measure, and it is still necessary to a measure. But wealth was actually an inducement to produce. It was an incentive to excel in some field of activity. This excellence might be in the making of a violin or in the development of some useful commodity. Actually, wealth in ancient times was closely associated with art and very closely associated with religion. It was a symbol of value. And this value was assumed to be a, a product of individual integrity. The individual was proving his ability through his own productivity. This productivity separated him from the indolent. The indolent person, the individual who had no concern for value, who wished to live without work, or wished to get by with as little labor and as large a profit as possible, must inevitably corrupt a system. He is not fulfilling his responsibility. Another rule of ancient Egyptian finance was that in the other life, the individual had to prove merit. He had to prove that his life had been in some way a contribution to public good. He had to have done something that was of service to others rather than himself. He had to have so lived that the world was a little bit better for the fact that he had lived. If his actions were such that the world was a little bit worse because he had lived, then he could not pass the final judgment. Today we are in a very complicated situation economically. And all the legislation in the world probably cannot solve it. It has to go back to where all responsibility in human affairs rests, and that is with the human being. For the highest form of wealth, as Egypt pointed out, was integrity. This was the one commodity. Integrity involved both honesty and intelligence. The individual who is unhonest is making one serious mistake, and another person who is unintelligent in the use of what he has is making another mistake. His non-intelligence is contributing to the delinquency of other people. All of the principles involved are simple. The difficulty is to find an instrumentation for them, 
we have to find some method in this world by which principles are given an opportunity to guide human conduct. As time went on and goes on today, there has also been a great change in the attitudes of people toward life. Even in our younger days, life was a comparatively well-ordered existence. The individual belonged to a group. He might be a member of a guild. He might be a member of a trade union. He could well be a small shopkeeper or a small town physician. But he had his niche. He had his place where he worked in the sense that he made his contribution to society. He lived within his means. It never occurred to him to live otherwise. And in spite of his in spite of the fact that he may, might be surrounded by persons who had more than he had, this did not seriously discomfort him, because he did not regard wealth as a symbol of superiority. He knew enough from personal experience or observation to realize the miseries of the rich. He realized that they were not enjoying what they had. Instead of enjoying it, they were servants to it. And Buddha points this out very, very clearly. Namely, that those who do not have much live miserably because they do not have more. And that those who have much live in misery for fear that it shall be taken from them. And everyone shares a certain common anxiety. This was quite according uh, to natural law and procedure. Now, when we come into the financial situation as it is, we realize that we have lost something. We have lost leadership. We have lost the guidance of the authority of principles. One of the principal factors in this situation has been materialism. Materialism has focused the mind entirely upon this small span of time which we call a lifetime. Materialism has made it mandatory that success be achieved here and that success here is the ultimate purpose of existence. In order to make this really stick, in order to be able to sell the idea on all levels of society, Materialism must, in some way, uh, interfere with the cultural uh, mor morality of antiquity. The materialist must not look forward to any life beyond this one. He must realize that it is his privilege, as one of the Roman emperors is supposed to have said, to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Even the Romans were a little smarter, however, because whenever they had a great feast, they reserved one seat at the head of the table, table and placed a skeleton in it to, re to remind all there that life was fleeting and that the inevitable was always close at hand. But in this problem, this, the concept of uh, accumulation built around a materialistic attitude of life made it very valuable to some people to think in terms of material possessions. These material possessions might be a piece of land, a building, valuable personal properties. Whatever it was, it was important. Yet we have no record up to the present time that any materialistic substance or possession can have a continuous effect upon consciousness. It must be left behind. Why then should we become so desperately dedicated to accumulations which at best are only loaned to us? We own nothing. We only own our own souls, and that we do not generally find sufficiently important to try to raise money on them. The materialistic position can only result, ultimately, in an overestimation of false values. 
if we are not aware of true values, then we substitute values that are not true and satisfy ourselves by the immediate accumulation of things rather than to contemplate the ultimate consequence. Now this world is a very interesting place and it has a great many dimensions that are worth a lot of thought. The human being can have a very interesting life and also a life that is very profitable in terms of things he can take with him. Among the things that he can take with him, according to the Egyptians, are the attributes of his own soul. His soul power is his universal medium of exchange. It goes beyond anything that belongs to this world. Now the power or treasuries or wealth of the soul are friendship, love, thoughtfulness, dedication, the improvement of the mind and heart, the accumulation of wisdom, and the practice of charity. These are soul values, and when the Egyptian jurors weighed the soul of the dead, these are the things that they estimated. What has the individual done that makes it proper for him to expect a better future? That he will go on to be what he was intended to be. Now, when we get started on the problem of our material existence and begin to estimate how much we can do with this small ball floating in space that we call the earth, we kind of take on the attitude that in some way or other, this little ball is going to sustain our concept of wealth. We want to investigate this little ball very carefully but we do not investigate it to find out what it means in a cosmic plan of things. We measure it in order to determine how many mortgages we can put on it. It becomes a problem of using the earth as collateral. And as a collateral, we are getting into some trouble. We like to think, perhaps, of this planet as like a bottle, an alchemical retort, a round transparent bottle and in this bottle are all kinds of hidden treasures everything under the surface of the earth is filled with all kinds of potential sources of good even the moisture that causes the plant to break through the surface is part of the evidence of an eternal life in the earth But if, for instance, instead of nurturing this, working with it, struggling to preserve and protect it, using the earth with a sense of responsibility to the creating power, if instead of this all we do is exploit the earth, there is a compensation which we do not like. For instance, we are going to be faced more and more with a petroleum problem. And we are going to fight and struggle and buy and sell and trade and swap and steal to control the available fuel resources. We forget this earth is a bottle and that it only has so much in it. And when what is in it is gone, it is gone. And it takes millions of years to replenish an exhausted petroleum field. Therefore... This whole situation is fraught with the greatest danger. And this danger is summed up in the concept of profit. We are willing to sell our birthright for a bowl of potash, in this case, a bowl of petroleum. But we are using our means for the wrong ends. What we should be doing is trying to understand the world we live in trying to know what the world rewards and what it punishes and learn to know how to use and not abuse what we have. In Rome, an old farmer once dug up a pot of gold in his field when he was plowing. He didn't know what to do with it. So he wrote a letter to the emperor and he said, I have found a treasure in the earth. What shall I do with it? The emperor wrote back two words. Use it. The farmer thought for a while, and he wrote another letter to the emperor, and he said, I don't know how to use it. Again, the emperor returned two words. 
abuse it. Now, this is more or less our problem. Not knowing how to use what we have, we misuse it. Instead of attempting to cooperate with a value that is far beyond money, we are bound together in a struggle for worldly possessions. Now, this does not mean that we should go off the deep end and all impoverish ourselves. This is not the end. The end is understanding. The individual who is pried loose from his wealth is in a very unhappy condition. But the individual who outgrows excessive possessiveness is a very wise person. And we need more of that kind of persons at the moment. So here we are with a a situation. A situation which has been intensified by materiality. Now, materialism is an attitude. It is uh, something that some people seem to come by naturally. Others achieve it by great effort. And still others have thrust upon them. But in all principle and in all fact, materialism is simply a point of view. It is an attitude towards something. It would have remained such it had not been for the fact that it has been scientifically organized. Science coming along uh, without a religious leadership has been aided and abetted human selfishness. It has devoted its researches and most everything that it has done to proving materiality, to prove that we live in a world in which skill takes precedence over honor. We have become very skillful, and for probably the uh, hundred years from the middle of the last century on, we have become increasingly proud of scientific progress and increasingly indebted to its productions. Now, science has done a lot of good. No one is going to say that it hasn't. The, science, the principles of science are go, the philosophical. They go back to the dawn of time. Man began to be a scientist the moment he decided to improve his state. Science in itself is not bad. We are not running down scientific achievement. What we are concerned with is the fact that science is not self-disciplined. That science instead of advancing the cause for which it should be advancing, has gotten sidetracked. An astronomer looking out in the sky cannot but be impressed by the magnitude of the universe and the comparative insignificance of himself. We look out upon an orderly way of existence, We are now not only hunting out galaxies, we are looking for holes in them. We are going on exploring, exploring space. But something about this exploration has been frustrated. When we explore space, what does it mean? What do we learn from the recognition of an infinite reality superior to anything that man can even understand. How are we going to advance scientifically unless the scientist thinks beyond the boundaries of materialism? Not only are we indebted to him for the exploration of nature, but we are indebted to him for all kinds of byproducts. And as we study these byproducts, we realize that many of them are also completely focused upon materiality. We find an educational system which is deficient in the most important thing in the world, and that is spiritual conviction. We find every profession, every art, every trade becoming more skillful, becoming better able to administer its various activities, but with little or no insight as to meaning. The meaning is lost. Where the meaning is lost, 
where the idealism fails, where all principles are downgraded to a large degree, where we are entertained only for the benefit of the advertisers, we are gradually becoming more and more disillusioned and are gradually being internally injured by an attitude which is unworthy of a human being. This means that uh, we are coming gradually to an impasse. We are trying to project materialism and make it the key to the universal procedure, and it is not. And no materialist has ever been able to prove that it is or ever will. We are losing our souls just as surely as Faust sold his immortal soul to Mephisto for a few years of of riotous living. This lack of the basic integrities has produced another effect. We have lost this consolation of spirit. We are undermining the friendship of nations. We are having massive difficulties with racial problems. We have all these difficulties, and we have no remedy. So the only thing we do is fall back upon a misuse of what we think might be a remedy, and that is to focus all our attention upon wealth. Wealth is something that you can reach out and touch. Wealth is something you can spend today. Wealth is something you can accumulate for good or no good reasons. But wealth becomes the goal of life. Just as the ancient dreamed dreamed of being better, the modern dreams of being richer. We have taken materialism, supported it by science, perpetuated by education, and have now accepted it as the key to universal security. This is simply poor thinking. In fact, it is so impoverished that it almost denies our essential humanity. Therefore, wealth is now the guiding spirit. It has taken over, and everything is measured in terms of it. The materialist not believing in anything after death has still further reason to enjoy the moment. Now, in enjoying the moment, we find that wealth as not only something that has to be accumulated, but it has to be administered. Now, one thing we should all learn, and nature probably would uphold us in this lesson if we would ever settle down to it, is that wisdom is the proper use of what we have. Wisdom means that we should apply all of our effort and our worldly goods uh, to the advancement of something that is superior Uh, to the delusion of of mortal superiority. We need to have, therefore, some approach that will give us a key to the situation. At the moment, uh, we may say that science has not the high reputation that it had 50 years ago. We do not look upon it as we did. Even a new mythology such as Star Wars doesn't completely compensate. In fact, it almost illustrates the problem. Actually, we are now in the midst of a positive application of the universal law of cause and effect. Science, without understanding, without spiritual leadership, without the integrities that come from philosophy, the modifying forces of art and literature, the testimonies of history, and all of the other contributing factors, science is in serious trouble. It has given us, as far as we can judge, the ultimate dilemma, the hydrogen bomb. With this, science could wipe out not only man, but himself and itself destroy everything that has been accomplished because that accomplishment was not built upon a solid foundation of internal integrities. As long as we continue 
to exploit the universe, we will suffer from our own exploitation. Wealth, therefore, must be used. Millions of dollars, billions of dollars, have been contributed to the advancement of science. Therefore, those paying the bill have a right to know that what they have supported is supporting them. That it is accomplishing for each of us a better life. That it is building securities instead of fomenting insecurities. That it can look forward to centuries of peaceful cohabitation between creatures upon this planet. Science should have led us to a golden age, and, but it got in trouble. It got tied up with the age of gold. And they are different things. So the use of money becomes the next responsibility. Use or lose was an old adage of Ben Franklin's, and it was a very good one. If you have, and you want to earn what you have, Suppose you inherited it. Suppose you've earned it with your own hands. Suppose you get it as in turn upon your investments. Whatever it is, whatever is your opportunity, is your next responsibility. Therefore, it is up to the individual and to society in general to make sure that those things which we have are rightly used. If they are rightly used, we justify them. If we use them as they should be used, there could be no reasonable complaint against them. But something must happen to cause the individual to assume responsibility for the use of what he has. This responsibility means thoughtfulness. It means that the person settles down to the wise administration of his own affairs. It means that he curbs his appetites, that he strengthens his moralities, that he functions upon a level of ethics and is consistent and reasonable in his conduct. These things deserve wealth, whatever it may be, because it means that ultimately this wealth will be returned to its own source and the whole world will be better. But what of the individual who doesn't think? He comes home with a very substantial paycheck. He doesn't realize, of course, that no matter how big it is, it does not actually represent value. But having received it, and having more of it than he ever had before, what does he do? He goes into various extravagances. And at the present time, uh, alcoholism is one of the byproducts of money not well used. Another byproduct is narcotics. Another byproduct is luxurious and extravagant means of life. Life that transcends the necessary, the reasonable, and the proper. Now it is the extravagance of the rich that has brought about practically every revolution in the history of the world. The individual who thoughtlessly and in vanity advertises his superior financial standing is a danger to his community. The great Japanese shogun, Ieso Tokugawa, was well aware of this. And when he became military dictator of Japan, one of the first things he turned his attention to was the bankers of Osaka. The bankers were a very close-knit fraternity and in the trading with the Netherlands and later with other countries, uh, they were very prosperous. And pretty soon, their wives and daughters, and even themselves, began to show evidences of luxury. The ladies wanted to wear the most expensive fabrics. The gentlemen wanted to have the most expensive fittings on their swords and on their, in, in their sashes. The children were dressed to kill. Everyone was going along, uh, living it up, to say, use a non-Japanese term. He also saw this, so he simply passed a law. Any person of wealth 
who exhibits this wealth excessively shall have his entire fortune confiscated by the state. He just took it away from them. He said, if, they, if we do not curb extravagances, if we continue to confront the people with the misuse of wealth, it will destroy the nation. Now, he lived around the U.S. dictator in the early 17th century, but he made his point very clear and made it stick that ostentation is the basis of anarchy. Now, we all know these things if we read history. Read given the decline of the Roman Empire, I'll tell you the whole story. But why are we continuing in this way? Why are we overlooking? Why are we allowing a perfectly wonderful life to be wasted by dissipation? Or why we allow a thoughtful mind to be dedicated only to trivia? Why is this possible in a world in which man has been endowed with higher faculties and powers? Well, one of the answers, of course, uh, lies in this problem of the lack of philosophical guidance. Someone asked in a newspaper not long ago for the name of two or three outstanding American philosophers. The editor replied, there are not any. There are plenty of scientists and economists to burn. And there are also all kinds of politicians. But there are no philosophers. And this lack of true philosophy has corrupted music, art, literature, clothing, it is corrupting human relationships, it is contributing to crime, it is breaking homes. It is creating millions of narcotic addicts, because now cocaine is one of the symbols of luxurious living. What's happening? The values have been forgotten. The true reason for wealth has been forgotten. The proper use of what you do have must be restored if you want to solve the existing problem. There is no other solution. Discipline, in this case, needs leadership. Now, where do we go for leadership in idealism? Well, we can look around, and it seems to be in short supply. But we have a tremendous reservoir of it, which we are neglecting, and that is religion. Religion has been in head-on collision with materialism. Because unless materialism discounts religion, its own position is impossible. So it is easier to deny religion than to correct the faults of science. But in spite of all the ups and downs, we have on this planet a reservoir of probably two and a half billion religion-oriented people. It is the largest existing social group. It excels all others in number and in basic instruction. It has much to contribute. Yet we will study the history of the Roman Empire. We will study the problems of the Renaissance. We will try to investigate what was wrong with the Medici. And we will also try to prove conclusively why Alexander died under the battlements of Babylon. And yet in our public school system, we are afraid to even mention the world's greatest unit, religion. There is no other part of human society that is more significant, has a longer and more unusual history, has had more ups and downs, and has been the cause of greater good or greater ill than religion. And yet we are not even allowed, really, to consider it as part of an educational system unless we go to a theological seminary. Now, we are quite in harmony with the idea that it probably is not proper in a democratic country to favor one religious group over another. This is in violation of a constitutional amendment which is primary and proper. But to... Face the face, the fact, frankly, 
there is no reason why religion cannot be part of education where it can be studied as one of the major institutions of human society. We should never be afraid or ashamed to mention it. We can approach it historically, we can approach it philosophically, but we do not need to become involved in theological disputes. But without some kind of idealism, and where are we going to find it? Where are we going to find an idealism that is a substitute for the Sermon on the Mount? And why do we need a substitute? So our monetary system, in order to straighten itself out, should read scripture a little more attentively to find out what it's all about. Our present economy that we are so proud of is not practical. It is not factual. It cannot survive the forces that are now gathering around it unless it becomes enlightened. It must begin the problem or accept the responsibility of the recognition of the responsibilities of success in any field or department of life. How would we go about to instrument this? Well, we know that it's going to be heavily opposed. We know that everyone is going to have some reason why he doesn't want it. But the fact remains that gradually that which we cannot control, and that is destiny, is stepping in. What man cannot handle, he must leave to heaven. And up to the present time, heaven has been keeping the galaxies in fair order for uncounted billions of light years. So we might have a little confidence in it. In this sense of the word, then, we notice with marked interest that what man does not voluntarily assume, he has thrust upon him. Within the last 25 years, there has been a great resurgence of religion. The individual placed in a condition absolutely precarious to his survival is beginning to think in terms of his own inner life. There are probably more persons attending church at the present time in proportion to the population than ever before since the end of the 18th century. We are gaining the realization that we must change ourselves and we must gradually build our foundation not upon a material anthill but upon an internal integrity which is infallible. This change is making inroads in every phase of our living. We are becoming more and more addicted to the idea of solving something. Communities are taking over their own projects. There is greater consideration for the unsolved problems. And most of the leaders in these better movements are either religiously or philosophically oriented. They believe in something above matter. They believe in, so they believe in something which can bestow upon mankind a true and proper guidance, a guidance which can lead him out of the present dilemma. But one problem, I imagine, is the same that faces nearly everyone, and that's fear. Fear can be a very dangerous and terrible thing. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, according to the Bible. Now, the translation of that word fear from the original Hebrew is not the best choice of words. It was not read, reason actually terror or something of that nature. Fear, in this case, is used more or less philosophically uh, to, to, to suggest or imply that we are afraid of our own evil. That we, uh, we fear the law of life if we break it. That we therefore would rather not break it and not bring down a retribution upon ourselves. 
But actually, man in his fear looks someplace to turn. He's looking for a place to find uh, the means to get a home when he can't find a place to live. He's beginning to be afraid of inflation. He is afraid of energy uh, limitations. He is afraid of a corrupted ecology. He is afraid of his neighbor. He is afraid of every institution which has exploited him down through the years. Therefore, fear ends in a kind of philosophical desperation. The individual finally decides that he has to reorient his own life and put his faith in that in which there is a right of faith. And the motto of the country, in God we trust, is coming true. We are beginning to realize that it is not entirely safe under existing conditions to trust anything else. So, to, f to find this faith, we have to look inside. We have to take the experiences of the day and distill from them something valuable. We cannot turn away this experience because we didn't like it and accept this failing because it seems pleasant. We are going to have to get down to, to basics, to a real foundation in values. It will come. Many people are very much disturbed and disappointed about all this. But I think very much definitely it will come. We are going to wake up. We were created to wake up. And it has been a long and tedious procedure. But in spite of all of his mistakes, humanity has survived. He is here. He is on and he is working. And little by little, he is beginning to discover a heart in his work. He is beginning to see that if he uses the natural resources of his planet wisely and unselfishly, we can all live together in comparative security. We can find ways of making our lives useful and beneficial and a source of inspiration inside of ourselves. Under such conditions, if we land in the judgment hall of Osiris, we will pass with shining on us. We will be safe. And our safety beyond this life is beginning to be more important to us. We are beginning to realize that there are many things we have hoped for here which are not going to happen. But we must recognize that no individual who is dedicated to principles can fail. Failure is a term in economics which means you do not succeed economically. But real failure has nothing to do with economics. It has primarily to do with the lack of internal growth. Therefore, a challenge is the most important thing in the world. And at this moment, the challenge of our economic system is the most pressing problem that we have today. We are talking constantly about trying to balance a budget. We are not in any position at the moment to balance it, according to the best we can find out, because when we think we have it balanced in one direction, it tips over the other. We are not going to be able to balance a budget until we integrate ourselves as human beings. If we are able to do that which is right, we realize that all the benevolences of life come from a power beyond ourselves. The fruit on our trees, the grass that grows under our feet, everything that we have belongs to a natural law, a natural procedure in space. We can benefit from it. We can be wonderful gardeners in the garden that has been given to us but when we subdivide it and sell it off, we are in trouble. This world is a world ruled by one divine plan. This divine plan does not object to the reasonable use of an economic system. It does not forbid or prohibit accumulation, but it does demand right use. And right use is something that uh, we have to think about quite a bit these days. I remember many years ago in New York, uh, I had talked with a very successful woman who was in finance. 
in those days she was not able to sit on the stock exchange and had to work through brokers. But she had a large estate. One day we were talking and she said, you know, there's nothing in the world that I would enjoy more than to become aware of the philosophic and religious values of life. I would like to settle back to contemplate some type of reality beyond the stock market. But she says, I can't. I'm completely locked. Every day is another problem. If I do not keep my mind on this, I'll be wiped out. I have to give my life to protecting what I have. Someday we're going to have to realize that we must give our lives to protect something that we are. And that if what we have makes it impossible for us to grow, then we are in very serious situation. So our problem with money is to use it as it was intended, as a medium of exchange, as a way of accomplishing a simpler social relationship, as an indication of the integrity of the seller and the buyer, and to make possible the involved transactions of a world ever increasing in population, which must find ways uh, to universalize its needs. We have to have these media, but they have to be in the hands of enlightened persons. They have to be freed from over-ambition. They have to be freed from monopoly. They have to be freed from ulterior motives. We have to learn what is the truth about some of these factors and situations. There is a revolt against most of the prevailing institutions simply because we can't live with them. Because they make us sick. We are forced to take on, in daily living, exploitation policies which make us uh, sensitive to values that do not actually exist and lose sensitivity to that which is true. The beginning of wisdom and the beginning of solution is that the human being must grow. And this growth is going to come, and he cannot prevent it. But the main point is that when growth begins, the individual must be open to it. He must be glad that it happens. He must value a magnificent experience far above a possession. He must put the possession of his own life in his own hands and lead it correctly. We have been given a kind of free will, which is really only a power of choice, as Aquinas points out. But we have the right of making decisions. And day by day, more people are making better decisions. And these better decisions will ultimately prevail. But they may only come when some situations become so desperate that we cannot survive without them. We're going to grow. We're going to succeed. We're going to use the instruments we have created. We are going to use all that science can give us. We're going to use philosophy properly. We're going to use our economic system constructively. We are going to organize our industrial structure so that all will have a fair part in the resources of nature. We will gradually integrate our religions, breaking through barriers of creed and sect, until finally we come into the realization that religion is merely man's effort to interpret from within himself the great laws of life under which he lives. These things will come because man will survive. I noticed coming down here this morning, I went over a little piece of property where there was were stones set together. And between two little blocks of concrete so close together that you could hardly put a knife blade between them, a, a little plant was growing. It was just a little weed, but it was certainly having a hard time. And yet it had adjusted to its need magnificent, magnificently. It survived what would normally be called an, an irresponsible and inevitable defeat. It be survived because there was life in it. And that that life was stronger than concrete. That life 
was going to be lived if there was any human possibility or natural possibility for its survival. We are much more important than that little plant, though perhaps in the universe it might take precedence in some matters, but in general, each individual has survival built in. He has the power forever to overcome that which he outgrows, become wiser, better, and nobler in all of his dreams and all of his aspirations. Success, eternal fulfillment is his, and a great cycle of lives which we must live, life after life, ensures the ultimate salvation of all that lives. The main thing is not to make it quite so hard on each other right now. If we're all going to survive, if we're all going to be ultimately enlightened and true and honorable, cooperative and loving and friendly, we might as well start now as wait until we get some more black and blue marks. There is no reason why, if the end that we seek is peace, that we shouldn't start to do everything we can to promote it now. And while we cannot always change others, we can come gradually to a relationship with life by which we understand the eternal benevolence that guides us through sorrow and misery to the fulfillment of our own purpose. Children make mistakes, but they outgrow them because they learn better. We are children. We have made mistakes. We are making mistakes. The only problem that is important is that we shall outgrow them. And we outgrow them by living above them, by changing our own attitudes toward them, by using all material things as symbols of spiritual values and spiritual realities. We need to have our dollar bill and sold. And that cannot be done at the mint. The ensoulment of a dollar bill is up to the individual who holds it in his hand. If he uses it wisely, he gives his own soul to it, and it serves the common good. If he uses it unwisely, it is but an empty body to go down to mortality. So it is up to us to ensoul the good, put new spiritual dimensions upon the institutions that could serve us well, but which we have permitted to fall into decline because of our own selfishness. We cannot be selfish and happy. We cannot be overambitious and live in peace. We cannot break the rules of life without a power that is greater than ourselves stepping in. We know this from experience. It is time for us to respect, regard, and love that power that steps in, for it is our hope of salvation. Thank you very much.